Well, good morning. Good to see everybody here. Uh, as mentioned, I thank you all for coming out on this beautiful Sunday morning. You know, when the children of Israel were right on the brink of entering the Promised Land, Moses gave them a speech. Uh, and it was, it was filled with some final instructions that he gave them for them to remember as they entered into the land. And this speech, or this sermon, or this teaching, instruction, whatever you might call it, is contained in the book of Deuteronomy. And the book of Deuteronomy is basically a retelling of the law, with some commentary and some added information there, and some really specific instructions for them, as they are, again, on the brink of entering into the Promised Land. And in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 19 and 20, we have a very specific instruction, a very practical instruction Moses gives. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, you have uh, instructions in connection to warfare. Of course, you know, uh, the children of Israel were not just a, a body of religious people. They weren't just a, a family people. They were those things, but they were also a nation. And therefore, as a nation, there would be times in which they engage in warfare. And this is an instruction that he gives, and again, it's, it's a very specific instruction, very practical instruction, uh, but a very useful one for them. Uh, this is what he says, again, this is Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 19 and 20. He says, If you besiege a city for many days to make war against it in order to capture it, you shall not destroy its trees by swinging an axe against them. For you may eat from them, and you shall not cut them down. For is the tree of the field a man that you should, that it should be besieged by you? Only the trees which you know are not trees for food you shall destroy and cut down, that you may build siege works against the city that is making war with you until it falls. Alright, so he's basically telling them, whenever you lay siege against a city. Now, warfare back then is a lot different than warfare that we have today. Today you just fly an airplane and drop bombs. Uh, or, you know, use tanks or other things, other methods. But back then, if you had a city, one of the main ways that you protected that city was you built a, a tall and wide and thick wall around the city. And that's what you used to, to protect it. Very similar to what you might think about with the castles in England and things like that. But you would basically have a wall around it that way that when the army came up against you, you would have some protection, a separation between you and that army. If you're the army that is trying to lay siege against that city, uh, you would do that very thing. You would lay siege works against the city. Of course, their gates are going to be shut, the, the walls are going to be secured, and the only way that you're going to be able to really get into that city, typically, was to go over the wall. And how are you going to go over the wall? Well, one way that they would do that is they would lay these siege works against it. So basically what you're doing is you're building a ramp up to the top of the wall, and that way you can go in and infiltrate that city. It also served another purpose too. As you circled that city and you laid siege on that city, they had no supplies going to them. You could block off all supplies going to them, going from them, and it would basically cause a very dire situation within the city almost like famine-like conditions to where people were starving and uh, of course they would then be in no position to fight because they would be completely famished and then once you made it over the wall of course you would have uh, at least the way the strategy goes you'd have a pretty easy time of overtaking that city. Here Moses is teaching them when you lay siege works against the city he's saying with the trees that are around that city you are not to cut down the trees that bear food. Uh, only cut down the trees that don't bear food. You can use that wood then to lay siege against the city. And there were a lot of trees in that particular area in ancient Israel that uh, bore food. You had the olive tree, you had the fig tree, you had the date palm tree, pomegranate tree, almond tree, carob tree, sycamore fig tree, pistachio tree, walnut tree, and a little less common, but still there, the apple tree. So there was a lot of different trees that bore different types of food. And none of these trees were you to cut down. And you might say, well, why is that? Well, wouldn't you want to use as much resources as possible to get over that city as quick as possible, or over those walls as quickly as possible? Well, the reason is given in verse 19. He says, for you may eat from them, 
and you shall not cut them down. And so you had something to eat um, while you were laying siege. A lot of times these siege, sometimes you would lay siege against the city and it could last for years. And uh, of course you'd want as much food available to you, as much nourishment as possible if you were laying siege against a particular city. And so he says, don't cut down the food bearing trees. Uh, these trees would provide them with nourishment that they needed to continue fighting. And, uh, you know, the irony of it is, if they would have cut down these trees that bore food, is that they would be doing to themselves what they were trying to do to the city. They would be cutting themselves off from nourishment and food and things that would give them uh, the strength and the energy to fight. And so this is a very specific instruction, right? Very practical, and you, you might think, well, why is this contained in scriptures for us? It seems like just some type of military strategy that maybe Joshua would have shared with them later on. But if we think about it in spiritual terms, when we think about this particular instruction from the standpoint of our spiritual lives, I think it has great application for us today. You know, we too are engaged in warfare. Now, we are a religious group. We are people connected to Christ spiritually. We are not a nation in the same respect that Israel was. And so we, of course, do not engage in physical warfare. I want to make that very clear. We, we are not to be engaged in picking up weapons to try to overtake the enemies of Christianity and things like that. We're not engaged in physical warfare. But we are, in a sense, engaged in a war. And I would say several wars. We have wars on several fronts as we engage in the spiritual life. And time and time again in the New Testament we're called soldiers because of this. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Philemon chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, And to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. And again in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 25 he says, But I regard it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. So the Apostle Paul calls these individuals fellow soldiers. But historically we know that the Apostle Paul was not in military service. He was not a soldier, a physical so uh, soldier. Not a part of the, the Jewish zealots, he wasn't a part of the Roman uh, army, nothing along those lines. He, when he's calling them fellow soldiers, he's talking about fellow soldiers of Christ. Again, referring back to 2 Timothy 2 3, where he calls him a, or he encourages him to be a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And so we're all soldiers. You may not have known that, but when you, when you were baptized into Christ, you enlisted into the army, into God's army, and you are a soldier. We are all fellow soldiers in the army. And, and as such, we are engaged in a war. And again, this war is on many fronts. And it's a very intimidating war and could cause us some um, consternation, some anxiety when we think about just how much uh, war we are at in various respects. For one, we are at war with very powerful spiritual beings. Do you realize that? We see things through flesh and blood. We see things through physical matter. Uh, we see things as they appear to us in our physical eyes, translated to us in our physical brains. But we're told through scriptures that the various things that we engage with in life don't necessarily have a physical source to them, but a spiritual. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 through 12, the Apostle Paul tells the church at Ephesus, Put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. If we really like soaked that in and thought about that, it would be overwhelming to think. Notice the military terms here. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Um, these world forces of darkness, the spiritual forces of of wickedness in the heavenly places. These are all military terms that he's using to describe this war that we're engaged in. And the encouragement is to put on the full armor of God in order to both defend ourselves from these attacks, but also to offensively um, counteract 
the attacks that come against us spiritually. And so we are at war with very powerful spiritual beings. There's a reality beyond this physical realm. There are beings beyond this physical realm that are always active. Uh, positively, we have angels that are engaged in uh, supporting and helping people of faith. But on the other side, we have demons and, and evil spirits that are also at work as well. And so we are engaged in this spiritual warfare, not just spiritual in the sense of figurative or metaphorical, but literally a spiritual warfare that we're engaged in. But we are also not only engaged in war with spiritual beings, but we're also at war with the flesh. You realize that? Spiritual beings are kind of out there, engaged, they're trying to get at us through circumstances, through other people, things like that. But there's something even more closer to heart than that, and that, and that is our own flesh. In Romans chapter 7, verse 23, says, But I see a different law in my members, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a captive to the law of sin which is in my members. Again, take note of those military terms. The law of his members, that is what his natural inclinations, his own um, instincts, animal instincts within him connected to the flesh, wages war against the law of the mind. And then talking about being a captive to the law of sin which is in my members. Again, military term, being a captive of war. Um, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, Behold, I'm sorry, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from fleshly lust, which wage war against the soul. But here you have the idea of the flesh waging war against our soul. Along with that is James chapter 4 and verse 1 where he says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures which wage war in your members? You see, within us, God has given us some wonderful and beautiful things, and He's constructed our, bi our bodies in a very wonderful way. Our bodies are made, like the rest of the animals who have bodies, our bodies are made for survival, right? Um, we're here to survive, and what do you need to do to survive? Well, you got to look out, a lot of times you have to look out for number one. And to do so, you gotta, you know, you got to be all concerned about self-preservation, Self-gratification, self-exaltation, these are all things that help you, whether you're in a pack, if you're a wolf in, in, a, in a pack of other wolves, or you're just out there surviving in the wilderness, you need to have these survival instincts within you to help you do that. The problem with it is, is that since we ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we now know right from wrong, and we know that sometimes we have to practice altruism, and self-sacrifice, and love, self-giving love, and we have to lay down our lives for the sake of another or for the sake of a particular uh, belief or commitment to Christ. And so there's always this war going on between doing what is morally right and then what I want to do and what will satisfy the desires of the flesh and be in accordance to the instincts there. So we are we have a, a, a warfare that takes place against spiritual beings in heavenly places, but we also have a war that takes place with our own bodies in, in the flesh. Not that our flesh is inherently evil, it just has these tendencies that often fight against the desires of the spirit. Uh, Galatians chapter 5 talks about how the spirit and the flesh are in opposition with one another. So there's always this struggle, this tension, this opposition within us between what we know is right and what we want to do. And what we should do, and what we should not do, uh, versus what we end up uh, doing or not doing. But then also we could think about the world in connection to warfare. And there may not be a specific verse that talks about uh, we're at war with the world or anything like that. But the world kind of works in, in a similar way that a lot of ancient armies would work back in that day. Similar to what we talked about with the siege. And that is, the world oftentimes just chokes out all spiritual life from us. It, it's like that army that surrounds the city and then blocks off all supplies until that city becomes completely famished. That's what the world does for us in our spiritual life. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 22, in connection to the parable of the sower, Jesus said, And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And so there's a sense in which the world 
We are so surrounded by the world. Today we have the world uh, infiltrating our lives into our, our very phones and our TVs and everything like that. Uh, it's really hard to escape the world in our day and age. And as such, if we're not careful, the world will just suck the spiritual life out of us. Uh, in a very subtle and um, in a way that that's, we may not recognize. And before we know it, we're spiritually destitute and bankrupt simply because we've been cut off from the supply of all spiritual life, Jesus Christ himself, because of the cares of the world, the desires of the world, and things along those lines. And so you, you think about it, we are at war, and the war is very intimidating. We've got spiritual beings fighting against us. We've got our own flesh waging war against our soul, against our minds. We have the world who, that would cut us off from all source of spiritual life. We are soldiers of Christ because we are constantly, every day, and maybe at the risk of making an overstatement, every moment at war. And so, as we think about this text in that context, we can see, okay, well then what is the spiritual application for us? Uh, what can we glean from Deuteronomy 20, 19 and 20 when it comes to the spiritual life? Well, if it was important for ancient Israel who were engaged in a physical warfare to not cut down the very source of nourishment and sustenance that would help them to overcome the war, overcome the battle, as important as it was for them, how much more important is it for us? When it comes to the spiritual life, we too should never cut down those food-bearing trees in our lives. Those things in our lives that we know nourish us, that help us, that strengthen us, that gives us renewal, that allows us to fight yet another day, that strengthens us for the battle. There's things that God has given to us, practices that we can engage in, in the spiritual life, that if we allow them, will bear much fruit in our lives. And we'll be able to reap much spiritual life from. And so this morning we just want to look at, I tried to get the most basic uh, fruit trees in the spiritual life. But we'll mention some kind of peripheral ones later on uh, as we continue in the study. But there's some things that are just non-negotiables when it comes to the, the spiritual life. Things that we should just be engaged in just because we're Christians. Uh, as a fish should be swimming, as a bird should be flying, as cattle should be grazing, the Christians should be engaged in these various activities. It just goes along with uh, connection to Christ. And one of the fruit-bearing trees that we have in this life, and a great blessing to the spiritual life that we have, is church. Coming to church. Um, just coming together with other believers, coming together with other people who are engaged in the same warfare, is extremely important for the spiritual life. It really gives us strength and help and encouragement to continue on in the battle. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25, we see at least two benefits of meeting with brothers and sisters in Christ. It says, And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Uh, we are stimulated to good works. We are also encouraged when we come together with other brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm um, going to church. Uh, every time the doors are open should just be a, a no-brainer. should be a non-negotiable. There are things I'll shift around in my schedule. There's things that I'll do this and that and the other. But I need to be here for services. That's where I get the strength, the encouragement, the stimulation to good works. All of those things are beneficial when coming together as uh, believers. Uh, it's in the church that we find help in overcoming sin. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, it says, Brothers, even if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each of you looking to yourselves so that you will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. By coming together and being a part of a community, we get to help each other out, bear each other's burdens. Hey, you're struggling with this. I have my own struggles, but let me help you with that. 
and, and pick you up in that. And, and let's pray for one another. Let's hold each other accountable. Um, there's a lot of things that can happen that will help us to overcome sin, but it takes place within the community of believers. Uh, it's very vital. And so have, coming together and being a part of a group such as what we have here is very important. You ever watch those National Geographic uh, movies? I used to watch, I used to have, back when there was a thing called VHS, I used to have a, a box of National Geographic. Uh, they were all the, the animal ones, the ones that are connected to animals and stuff. And uh, you'd watch those and you, you could see how the lion or the cheetah, uh, whatever it was, the predator, how it would operate. What it would do is, it would, it would see that herd of uh, zebras or whatever it was, and it would be looking, and it would be looking for that, the weak one in the herd. And then what it would try to do is it would try to separate that one from the rest of the herd. And once it did that, there was no, the other animals would not protect it. It would be off on its own. It's also weak, which makes it vulnerable in and of itself. And that's the one that it would attack. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 5 that Satan is like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And we make ourselves, we put a big bullseye on our chest when we're out on our own doing our own thing spiritually. But when we're in the herd, when we're with other people, when we're, when we're embedded in a community of believers, there's a certain protection there that takes place where I don't have to fight these battles on my own. I can lean on my brothers and sisters and you can lean on your brothers and sisters and we can find encouragement and strength and protection and accountability, all those different things. Uh, the church is a valuable asset to an individual engaged in the spiritual life. And that's a fruit tree that should just remain in your yard. You just let it be there. You want to fertilize it. You want to water it. You want it to grow as much fruit as possible. Don't cut down that fruit tree. Uh, it's very vital for giving you the strength and nourishment and the sustenance that you need for the battles that you engage in. Now on the other side of the spectrum, uh, spending alone time, solitude. So we talked about community, a social aspect to uh, the spiritual life, but now there's also an important part of it to where we are spending time in solitude alone, alone with God, by ourselves. Uh, this can be a fruit-bearing tree in our lives. Jesus practiced this in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 23. It says, And after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. Jesus, after he fed them the, the loaves and the fishes and things, he's, okay, he's done a lot of preaching. He had a, if you follow the chronological, um, if, if you follow Jesus' ministry chronologically, you see that that day was a very long day. I mean, he had been engaged in so much activity for the kingdom. And then eventually, we find in John chapter 6, they were trying to make him a king. That was also part of it. But he just sent everybody away. He went on the mountain to pray, went alone to be with his father. In Luke 9, 18, it says, and it happened that while he was praying alone, his disciples were with him and questioned him, and it goes on. Jesus was a person who separated himself. He knew how to engage with people. He knew how to help people. He was definitely a people person in that regard, but Jesus also knew the importance of spending time alone with his father. And if Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the divine one who came to us in human flesh, the one who was more connected to God the Father than anybody else who had ever lived on earth, needed that quiet time, that solitude, that time to pray and connect with his Father. How can we think that we can get away without it? It's absolutely essential uh, to flourish in the spiritual life. That is a fruit-bearing tree that we can pull from and reap from all the time. And it's also sometimes the most difficult one. Um, sometimes we have to shift some things in our schedule. Uh, one thing I noticed on the weekends for me is uh, because I go to bed so early during the week and I get up so early, I get up uh, around 3.30 in the morning and I go to bed at 8.30. And on the weekends I was like, okay, now I can stay up late and I can sleep in, try to catch up. But I've come to realize that, that the things that I did from say 9 to 11 o'clock, weren't really benefiting me. Uh, they weren't really fruitful things in my life. I would probably just, I'm so tired at that point, because especially on Fridays, I've gotten up at 
I'm not really doing anything useful. I'm just vegging out in front of the TV or something like that. So what I've began to do over the past month or so is continue to go to bed early on the weekends. That way I can get up. I get up at 5.30 in the morning, 5 to 5.30 in the morning. I just sit out under the stars. Oh, that's, I love it. Sitting out under the stars, praying to God, praying to the one who created uh, all those beautiful constellations and the moon as it's shining in the heavens. That has brought tremendous value in my life, and I only bring it up to encourage us all. If you have to shift things around, whatever you have to do to get that quiet time with God, do it. It will bear so much fruit in your life, and it will be so beneficial. I can speak from personal experience. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Our society is riddled with depression, anxieties, fears, and trepidation. There is no peace in the hearts of the average American. And sometimes there's not even peace within the average Christian. How much peace, how much comfort, how much encouragement would we receive if we just spend a long time with our God in prayer, it helps us to refocus, it helps us to recalibrate our minds, it helps us to see things from God's perspective, it helps us to see that the matters that we think are so big aren't so big, and helps us to connect to God in that way. And again, at the risk of making an overstatement, I would say that it is impossible. And no, I don't think it's an overstatement. It's impossible to draw close to God without prayer. You just cannot do it. Praying just real shortly before you eat and saying a quick prayer as you fall asleep isn't going to cut it. Imagine if, I know this is an overused analogy, but i got to use it because it's, it's very useful. Imagine if you married your spouse. On the wedding day, you know, you married each other, you said, I do. And then you say, well, we pretty much said everything we needed to say before we were married. Now we don't need to talk anymore. I'm going to... Say hi to my wife right before we eat, and then I'm going to say goodnight, kiss her before we go to sleep, and that's the only time I'm ever going to talk to her. Or the same with the wife to the husband. Ooh, what a flourishing relationship that would be, eh? <laughs> no, it would not. Uh, of course, our relationship would just wither. We would be disconnected from our spouse. We would be living with a stranger if we did that. But how often is that a good description of our relationship with God? Well, I got saved. I came to the Lord. Uh, I prayed to Him. Uh, I was seeking Him. I was baptized, placed into Christ. Now I'll just talk to Him occasionally. I'll talk to Him before I eat. I'll talk to Him before I go to bed. That should be good enough. Does that work for any relationship? No, it does not. And it doesn't work with our relationship with God. We've got to speak to our Heavenly Father. We've got to be in communion with Him, in communication with Him. It's the only way we'll draw close to Him. Prayer is essential and it's one of those staple trees. You have the tree of church, we could say, that's always bearing fruit for us, but we should also have the tree of prayer. That's always just nourished, fertilized, bearing fruit for us. If we do so, we'll have such peace, we'll have such joy. All of our anxieties will begin to dissolve as we just draw closer to our Father who transcends all the situations that we're in. Prayer is essential. Uh, and one of those trees we should not cut down. Spending time in God's Word is also a fruit-bearing tree in our lives. James chapter 1 and verse 21 says, Therefore, laying aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and gentleness, receive the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls. Likewise, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 says, Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. There's a lot of growth, spiritual growth, that just comes... By being in God's Word. Peter says we should be like newborn babies. And if you've ever taken care of a newborn baby, whether it's your own baby or maybe someone else's, and you watched them for a while, the baby will let you know very clearly when they want that milk. They long for the milk. When they get hungry, their whole body just shakes. And they're yelling at the top of their lungs, screaming out for that milk. Because they know, well, because, I guess as a baby, because they're hungry, but 
Uh, God has put that in them because God knows that they need that milk to grow. And they need that milk to, you know, to flourish and to mature. The same thing is true with us with God's Word. If God's Word, if we go just a day without God's Word, do you scream out and say, i got to get back into the Word. I'm hungering for the Word. I miss being in the Word. Is it really a staple part of your life? Being engaged in reading the Word, but not just reading it real quickly, but just meditating over it, letting it saturate into your mind, marinate in your mind, maybe just taking one passage of Scripture and just letting it go over and over in your mind as you reflect on it, think about it, or maybe getting out your concordances and your lexicons and all these things and digging, really digging in, saying, okay, how does this uh, word connect with the word as it's used in this particular text and, and how does it fit in with the context here in this paragraph but also in the overall book? Like just really getting into God's Word and just diving feet first into God's Word. Uh, God's Word is, is one of those fruit trees. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 12 through 14 says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern both good and evil. As newborn babes, we're longing for the pure milk of the word, but as we mature, we begin to look for the meat of the word, the more substantial things in the word. In the context here, the Hebrew writer is talking about some pretty deep things. He's talking about the priesthood of Melchizedek, uh, and how that connects to the priesthood of Christ, and, and, and how... Uh, because Christ was according to the order of Melchizedek, it's superior to the order of Aaron, uh, which was found in the, in the law. Very deep things, and the Hebrew writer is a little uh, put out because he's saying, I really want to dig into this subject, but uh, I'm kind of uh, hindered because of your lack of understanding of the scripture. And we need to be people, yes, that do drink the milk. We need those simple truths and stay on those simple truths and be reminded of those simple truths of the gospel and Things connected to that, but at the same time, we need the meat. Um, I like to drink a little milk every once in a while, but I can't live on milk. I got to go to the meat. I got to go to the meat and potatoes, and we need the meat and potatoes of Scripture uh, as well if we want to flourish in the spiritual life. Second Timothy chapter three, verses sixteen through seventeen says, "All Scripture is God breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction." For training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, Scripture is God-breathed. This isn't us studying Shakespeare or studying um, John Keats or something like that. And I love those guys. I love reading their works. But we can't say of their works what we can say of God's work. It's God-breathed. It's given to us. And it's profitable for teaching us instructing us on in how to live, for reproving us when we need to be reproved and to correct us, to train us in the way of righteousness, and then also to equip us. If we are not in God's Word, then we're missing out on the fruits that it can bear in our lives. And, and I would say, in our day and age, with the access that we have to God's Word, you don't even have to buy God's Word. You can you can just find it anywhere. You can find it on the internet. You can find it on your phones, on an app. You can find it very cheap, wherever you, wherever you might want to buy it, half price books, whatever. Um, what you get out of it is way more valuable than the cost of the book itself. Um, and we have really no excuse in our day and age to not be in God's Word every single day. Because of illiteracy in the, in the past in the church, because of the limitations without the, the, um, the printing press. There were some limitations as to how much people could access God's Word. And that should not be an excuse of why we wouldn't be in God's Word, given those things. Jesus said to him who much is given, much will be required. God has opened up the doors, the floodgates of His Word, so they can pour into every house, every home. Are we taking advantage of that? Are we drinking of the Word? Are we plucking the fruit from the tree of God's Word? and receiving benefit from it, or have we cut it down? Has it become ineffective in our lives because we cut ourselves off from it? Hopefully not. And then we have worship. 
And this is the last of the four staple uh, trees that we should have in our spiritual life. Um, worship. Uh, we looked at coming to church. We've looked at um, prayer. We've also looked at God's word. But worship is also important as well. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, it says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God, even the Father, and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. It says, be filled with the Spirit. And what's connected to being filled with the Spirit? Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart. You want to open up avenues for the, for the Spirit and to be filled with the Spirit. Get engaged in worship. Singing songs to others, brothers and sisters, but we could even say uh, in the privacy of our own lives. Singing to the Lord, worshiping Him and praising Him. John chapter 4 verses 23 and 24 says, But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. And when we talk about having worship as one of those fruit-bearing trees, it's just not having, you know, Christian music playing in the background while we're doing other things. It's not just uh, having, um, you know, Christian music playing while we're engaged in w work at home and things. And, and that might be a good practice to do. When I'm talking about worship, I'm talking about, like, worship, Okay. Where you just pour your heart out before God, you open up your spirit to the Lord, you are either physically on bended knee or, you know, spiritually on bended knee before the glory of God at the throne room of God, just worshiping Him from every fiber of your being. Worshiping, worshiping Him ushers you in to the very throne room of, room of God. Prayer gets you into contact with God, and that's important. Prayer gets you in communication with God, but worship thrusts you into the presence of God. Worship is one of those things that will bring into your heart the awareness of God's presence like, perhaps like no other thing. God, it says in, here in John chapter 4, God is seeking those who will worship Him in that way. Worship in spirit and in truth. Not just with the head, not just with truth, but in spirit, from the heart. God is looking over the, all of His creation, looking for such worshipers who will worship Him in that way. And sadly, I would say perhaps He even looks among the church and struggles to find those that are truly worshiping Him. And this isn't just limited to Sunday mornings. definitely includes Sunday mornings. But we're talking every day, opening up our hearts to the Lord. It could be connected to that solitude that we have with God. Be connected to prayer. Worship doesn't have to always be in song. It can be in prayer. It can be in other things. But the idea is just that we're connecting to God in the awe and the wonder and the beauty of who He is. That's worship. Worship makes God bigger and makes me smaller. And that's a healthy thing in the spiritual life. So when it comes to these fruit trees, these are the staple trees, okay? These are the non-negotiables. Uh, we need to be going to church, we need to, be, uh, we need to be praying, we need to be in God's Word, we need to be worshiping, we need to be doing all these things. But there might be other things in your life, other things that you've experienced, that, that you know draw you closer to God. And we can't list out every single thing that could possibly help you and be a fruit-bearing tree in your life. But I bet you know what they are, uh, because you've experienced them. Maybe spending time in nature is beneficial to you. That's one of the things that I enjoy, going on nature walks and going out and spending time with God in His creation. Um, it might be fasting. It might be saying, okay, for this period of time, I'm going to go without eating. I'm just going to focus on God. I'm going to put aside that even that most basic need so that I can focus on God, not cooking, not running to Whataburger or whatever. I'm just going to focus on God today. Um, that might be something beneficial to you. Journaling is something that a lot of people find uh, useful, uh, either writing out prayers to God or, or jotting down thoughts that they have, uh, thinking things over by writing it down, has been useful for a lot of people. Maybe meeting with a fellow Christian uh, for lunch once a week. The list could go on, but the main thing is that we, that we recognize what those things are. 
And one of the ways that you can do that is just maybe right now, even right now, think about times in your life when you felt most close to God. Uh, it could be just a moment. Maybe there was a time, maybe you were at the beach and, you, and, it, and the sun was setting and ooh, you just felt this overwhelming sense of the love of God over you. Or maybe it was for a whole season in your life. Maybe it was when you're engaged with uh, various ministries or you're engaged in various things and, and you were focused on God and you just felt so spiritually rich and, and vibrant. Think of those times, reflect on those times, and then consider the circumstances around those situations. What were you doing at that time when you felt so close to God? When you were drawing close to Him, uh, and you were closer to Him than you, than you ever were? Was that a time when you were perhaps uh, uh, more consistently going to church, or more involved in God's Word, or praying more? Or was it because you were going on more nature walks then, or you were journaling more? Whatever it was that you were doing at that particular moment when you felt so close to God, think about that. Reflect on that. Consider that. Unfortunately, the pressures of life and the busyness of our schedules begin to press down on us. And often we cut down the wrong trees. My yard is too overgrown with trees. And instead of cutting down the non-food bearing trees, we cut down all the fruit trees and leave the other ones there. We leave social media standing high. We leave TV uh, unthwarted, un unchallenged. We leave all these other trees that bear no real benefit to our lives, that aren't wrong in and of themselves, but when it comes down to it and we need more time, we cut those down, or we cut down the fruit bearing trees instead of cutting those down. We gotta be like surgeons. We gotta be meticulous. We gotta be, uh, we have to show some forethought on which things we cut out of our lives and which things remain. If we don't, we'll starve ourselves of the very nourishment we need to face the pressures of life and the busyness of our schedules. We need those fruit-bearing trees because we're so busy. We shouldn't cut them down because we're busy. We need them all the more because we're busy. Because life is so pressing in our day and age. We have to remember that a rich life is one in which we are abiding in Christ, walking according to the Spirit, setting our minds on things above, and engaging ourselves in deeds of love and good works. If we're not experiencing these things, it might very well be the case that we've cut down the wrong trees. So my encouragement for you as we close is to do two things today. But maybe you've already done it as we've, been, as we've been sitting here, but at some point today I, I would ask you to do this thing. I'm going to give you some homework, okay? Do two things. First, reflect. Do what, what I mentioned before. Think of those times when you were closest to God. Things that you were engaged in uh, the circumstances around those times when you were really close to the Lord, whether it was for a moment or it was for a whole season. Reflect on them. Recognize those trees. You first have to know which trees are the food-bearing trees, right? And then plan. Make a plan. Schedule it out. Um, you can't wait until it's, you know, 11.30 at night and you're about to set your alarm clock to say, Oh yeah, I was going to stay up early. I was going to get up early to spend some quiet time with the Lord. By then, you're just going to rob yourself of sleep. I'd encourage you to still get up, but by then, you've, you haven't prepared well. Yes, reflect, recognize those trees, but then plan ahead and say, how can I nourish those trees? How can I plant, if they're not there at all, how do I plant those trees and let them grow up? What are some things I can do in my life to plant those trees? But then also, what can I do to nourish them, to fertilize them, to let them really grow and take root in my life? Plan it out. Make a schedule. Say, these are, some, these are the non-negotiables in my life. This is when I'm going to do them, and I'm not going not gonna, to uh, not gonna turn on them. Remember Daniel, in the book of Daniel? Uh, I think Sam is, was taking y'all through the book of Daniel, but, um, boy, I'm inspired by Daniel. Uh, that edict came out, you know, uh, no one was to pray except for to pray to King Darius. And what did, what did, what did Daniel do? He was accustomed to praying three times a day. He heard the edict. He says, okay. Hmm. All right, well, I'm going back and I'm going to pray my three times out the window towards Jerusalem. Uh, and he almost got eaten by lions because of it. Are you that firm on these non-negotiables that someone could throw you in a lion's den and you're not going to give them up? Now, that might be a little bit extreme, 
but hopefully it gives some perspective. Recognize these fruit trees, protect them with all your all your all you can, and nourish them and let them really bear fruit in your life. If you do that, you'll be strong, you'll be vigorous, you'll be comforted, you'll be encouraged, you'll be well and able to engage in the warfare that we have on many fronts in the Christian life. If you're here this morning, your first step, and you haven't come to Christ, your first step, your first fruit tree is coming to Christ. Christ presents himself as the tree of life. Um, we ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as opposed to the tree of life in the garden. And we missed out for a time on the tree of life, but now Christ has come to be the tree of life for us. That we can partake of the fruit that he provides, and live forever, to have eternal life. Would you... Would you please eat of that tree of life today? Would you please connect yourself to Christ, give yourself over to Him, and begin that wonderful, beautiful journey of living with Him and having Him with you forever? If you'd like to do